Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, by my computer's clock, we have just arrived at 45 minutes past the hour. I'm delighted to be here, but I can confirm, as Cliff said earlier, it is absolutely <laughs> dazzling up here. So it's very hard to see anyone, and that might be interesting when we get to the, hopefully, questions part of the panel. Um, I hope uh, Cliff and Diane will forgive us, but we're subject to a, an off-by-one error in the naming of this panel. Delighted that Elizabeth can join us from Chicago. Um, we will all introduce ourselves when we make some introductory statements, um, but I'll just give maybe just a couple of moments of background. Uh, this panel comes out of a series of really useful discussions a number of us have been having uh, as IT directors at research libraries that are implementing or thinking about implementing Folio. Um, we find these are useful because we have a bunch of issues that might not be shared by all of the Folio community. Things that spring to mind for me are issues of scale, the amount of usage uh, we we put Folio 2 and the sort of types of integrations we're thinking about. Next slide, please, Sean. Um, so just in case this isn't uh, something you're already fully familiar with, what is Folio? I like always to start off by saying Folio is a really cute acronym. The future of libraries is open. Well, we certainly hope it is. Um, but more than that, Folio is an extensible library services platform. And I think here we're making a distinction between a library services platform and an ILS in the sense that it is designed to be the foundation for additional functionality beyond what might be included in an ILS. So, you know, things that come to mind in the way I'm thinking about things are, what about some of the reporting functionalities here associated with Folio? How might we leverage that to do reporting around things that are not traditionally part of the ILS? Or what about the module we add in to support controlled digital lending in a very smooth way. That might be nice. Um, the Folio community is an open source community, and most interestingly, it's a collaboration between librarians, developers, and vendors. The unusual part there being between academic institutions and vendors. Um, that, I think, gives it great strength. Uh, in the last year, we've spent additional effort as part of the community uh, reformulating and formalizing the governance model to add a third council over the, the pre-existing technical council and product council, the community council, to sort of look after the overall health and structure of the community, including governance going forward. And I think the third bullet there, probably is an opportunity for us as libraries to actively shape infrastructure that is key to our operations in a way that will evolve to meet our needs. Um, I think just to make a distinction here, although a number of us on the panel are involved in Folio community and project governance, uh, as far as this panel, we're speaking as ourselves as part of our institutions. And Sean, next slide, please. I think first up is Elizabeth. Hello, um, I'm Elizabeth Long. I'm the Associate University Librarian for IT and Digital Scholarship at University of Chicago and also currently the Interim Library Director. And we all are going to talk a little about our own kind of situations in regard to Folio and maybe our, our, our journeys to get to where we are now. And so I wanted to start with, um, in 2014, when we launched Olay and Viewfind. And so we had been part of already a community building software uh, to support L traditional ILS or LMS functions. Um, at that point, we launched both of those as locally hosted um, pieces of software. And after a not too long period of time, we then got to the point where Olay was clearly transitioning into something different and ending its, itself. And so in 2017, we put together a task force to evaluate what our options were. We knew that Olay was going to be end of life, and so we needed to think about what our next move was going to be. And what came out of that, we did not want to make an assumption that because the Olay community was kind of retooling and 
and becoming Folio, um, starting in many ways from scratch, but it was the same group of people who were involved to some extent. But we didn't want to assume we were just going to Folio, so we really did a pretty thorough e evaluation of the options. And we came away from that very excited by the vision that Folio had, and I think part of what, what Simeon was just talking about, thinking of it not just as a traditional ILS or LMS, but really thinking of it as a platform that was extensible and could be thought of going in, in many different and new directions. And that was very exciting to our staff. It also, we realized, was a very good cultural fit for us. We were used to having direct access to our database, to our data. We were used to having involvement in the development of the software. We were very committed to open source. And so all of those made us make that decision that we wanted to go with Folio. And at that point, more fully commit ourselves to involvement in all of the governance structure, the, the different special interest groups that were defining what Folio was, was becoming. And, and we have a lot of staff who've been very deeply involved in that since 2017. So our original goal was that we would be going live um, in July of 2021. We had the traditional belief that we'd always held that you could only do a system change at fiscal year rollover. And as it became clear that Folio was not quite ready for us, but also we were not quite ready for Folio, we put that off. And what we were aiming for was actually what would have been a launch today <laughs> that is not happening. I'll talk a little about where we went instead. Um, so, so we had been aiming for, we, we turned around and said, we actually realize we can go sometime other than fiscal year rollover. That's, that's a doable thing. And that was a really important step forward for us in how we thought about implementing a system. During all of this time, we had a uh, real lack of staffing. Um, we had some open positions that, especially once the pandemic hit, we had uh, hiring freezes and were not able to, to fill those, but we also had so many other competing open positions that we had a real problem thinking about how do we manage this project going forward. And so we actually contracted with Index Data to act as project managers for us just doing the prep to get to where we could be thinking about what planning migration itself would look like. We have also subsequently worked with them and they are going to be our hosting provider and are, are working with us very closely on our migration. In the meantime, something else I wanted to call out was a collaboration that ended up happening between us, Cornell Duke and Tamu where we realized there were some things we wanted and, and the highest priority one was an integration with OCLC's connection. And so we worked with Index Data to build that as something that we did to, to you know, bring back to the community, but kind of separate from the ongoing folio schedule for when things would get done, because we saw that as high priority. And that's the type of thing that really was for us the, the vision we were looking for was an ability to have partners and to work on things that were high priority to us. So we did go ahead and launch our, our um, ERM module in July because that was not something we had and so it was a new thing and that was easy to go ahead and launch but we did do that delay and just at the end of November, we realized that we were not fully ready for Folio. We had a couple integrations that were still complicated. And so our new go live date is the weekend of, of um, Martin Luther King will be launching on MLK Day and, and doing that full migration over that weekend. Uh, we're going to be going live on Juniper. I think we're all talking about which, which version we'll go live on. Um, and so we're still also going to be using Viewfind. We've redone it under the hood to point at the new version, but uh, that we're not changing. We're hoping that it will be very seamless from our patron perspective. So I think I'm turning it over now. Uh, yes, to Cornell. I think it's me again, yes. So I guess I'll start our story from uh, what uh, Elizabeth just mentioned in that in 2014, we separated our discovery system from our Voyager ILS adopting Blacklight. Um, and that has worked out very well for us. We really have had 
remarkably few patron facing changes as a result of our move to Folio. And we've had to change some of the integrations associated with that, but not the system itself. So that allowed us to, you know, split a big problem into two slightly smaller problems, which is always a good idea. We did a significant analysis of the environment in 2015 with Columbia as part of the Too Cool project then, where we looked at Alma and Folio. And shortly after that, Cornell decided that it would move ahead and join what was then the Olay Consortium, although it had already, as Elizabeth mentioned, pivoted toward a, a new vision of, of what would become Folio. So that was our first engagement with the project. And we've had uh, Holly Misselbauer, for example, who's been involved in that work for the community ever since that time. We had originally targeted a July 2020 go live, um, but as we tracked the progress of the project in 2019, it became clear that the project would not be ready to meet our needs in the summer of 2020. And indeed, I think that was a sensible assessment. And we delayed our go live to July 2021. We did uh, move forward. We were at that time self-hosting a development version of Folio. And in early 2020, we took just a smaller part of the system around our ERM, electronic resource management functionality, and went live in January. What, as IT director, I later found out was our development system, but that's fine. Um, so that, that went successfully in January 2020. And later that year, we contracted with EBSCO both to help with our migration and for hosting going forward. So we actually did later in 2020 a migration of this ERM functionality from our self-hosted version into the EBSCO hosted version, which went very smoothly. And from that time, it was heads down, track all the things that we had decided were really essential and work toward a go live of summer 2021. We had not overcome the hurdle Elizabeth mentions of considering a go live other than our fiscal year boundary, which is July 1. Um, and we never got past that. So while we were coming up toward our July this year go live, it was really for us a decision. Are we going to go this year? Is Folio ready? Or do we have to wait another year till July 2022? We determined in the end that it was ready, and we did go live, and we are live, and it is working. Um, we don't have everything we want, and I think we'll probably be talking about this a bit more, but our libraries are, you know, checking out books and all doing all the things <laughs> they do. Um, just at the end of this week, we're upgrading from Iris, which is the version we went live on, to Juniper, and that's our next step. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Wittenberg. I'm the Assistant Dean for Research and Innovation Strategies at the University of Colorado Boulder Libraries. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what happened before I got to CU Boulder in 2020. So please don't ask me about the dark days before June 1st of 2020. Uh, we've been contributing to Folio for quite some time. We had some representation on the Olay board, and we've been contributing half of a developer to a Folio development for a couple of years now, starting in 2017. I think it was actually my first day on June 1st of 2020 that Paul Muller, the librarian who became our Folio product owner, came to me and said, welcome to CU Libraries. We have to figure out what we're gonna do with our ILS. Um, you know, what, what direction do you want to take this? And uh, I said, well, first of all, tell me a little bit more about the Folio project. So I'm new to the Folio community. Um, and, you know, our digital strategy in general at C Libraries um, is built on, you know, this, this premise that our infrastructure in our libraries should both reflect and advance our core values. Um, and, you know, those core values are centered on transparency and openness and access. And that's the primary reason that we made the decision to move to Folio 
um, for our LSP. One of the decisions that we had to make in 2020 when we were grappling with what we were going to do next was, you know, is this something that we should do by ourselves or is this something that we should do as a system? So at the University of Colorado, uh, we have five libraries across four campuses that are sort of administratively separate units. CU Denver, uh, Anschutz, our medical campus, Colorado Springs, CU Boulder, our flagship, and the CU Boulder Law Libraries. And our approach to thinking through folio implementation uh, and adoption and collaboration was as a shared service system-wide across all of our campus libraries. Uh, we have an internal program that I've highlighted here called Financial Futures, and that's essentially a uh, a campus program at CU Boulder that enables individual units to apply for seed funding for projects that will eventually save the campus some money. Um, and our approach to folio implementation was to leverage the uh, multi-tenancy of folio to make a case for a financial futures proposal. And we wrote an application, we spent much of 2020 doing that um, together. Uh, across all of our campuses, uh, and I submit it uh, to our CFO with letters of support from each library in the system. In late 2020, we were notified that we were successful, um, and we received funding from the campus that is paying for our folio developers until we migrate off of Sierra, which is our current ILS. So that's how you know, we were able to uh, have this kind of overlap between um, uh, Sierra and Folio. Uh, once we received notification that, you know, we had, we had been approved by the campus to move forward with this project, um, we were able to hire some developers and uh, make some decisions around what we were going to do for discovery. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really work out al alphabetically that Sean's before me. Uh, but <laughs> MSU had already started uh, their migration process and were on the sort of same ILS discovery stack as we were, so moving from Sierra and Summon, um, and we were able to have some, some conversations that were really important for us in setting direction for CU. So we decided to migrate to a shared folio EDS instance um, with full commitment from our law libraries but with continued participation um, and, uh, and sort of some collaboration from our other libraries who at this point are still deciding when, uh, if and when, they are going to move over to Folio. Uh, in, uh, in 2021, we also signed our contract with Index Data, who are managing our migration. Um, and we expect that in summer of 22, just about six months from now, um, we will we will be live with full folio and EDS implementation. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Tim McGarry. I'm the Associ Associate University Librarian for Digital Strategies and Technology at Duke University. And uh, Duke University's history goes to the very beginning of uh, of the story. Um, and maybe we should have done it in that order rather than alphabetical. <laughs> um, in 2008. Um, before anything with the open library environment started, um, Duke University was one of the Triangle Research Library Network libraries that launched um, Search TRLN, which was powered by Indeca and became one of the very first uh, faceted discovery tools used for library catalogs. Um, and this really set the um, vision and the strategy for the Duke University libraries in thinking about how we wanted to approach integrated library systems and library services platforms. And through that process and through um, and other conversations that um, Deborah Jacobs had had with, um, uh, with leaders uh, around um, the country and leaders within Duke, um, they launched the open library environment um, in 2008 um, in support um, of, uh, through support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And so we had a year long program uh, an investigation program about what we wanted to do as far as transforming integrated library systems and creating an open um, s systems. Um, and eventually this became um, Olay. And um, while I wasn't at Duke at the time, I was part of this process when I, when I was at Lehigh University. So it goes, I've, I've been in this from the very beginning. 
Um, from 2009 through 2016, uh, Duke University hosted a number of grants that supported Olay and through its very in, various iterations, which you've already heard a bit of, uh, particularly from Elizabeth's uh, talk about um, of the various iterations of Olay. And in 2016, uh, as you remember, um, Folio launched in partnership between Olay and EBSCO. And Duke was still hosting Mellon grants to support Olay, and we wrote one final grant with the Mellon Foundation to transform our support from, from Kuali Olay um, into Folio, um, which uh, just ended uh, last year. In 2019, we circled back with our Triangle Research Library partners on Open Discovery, and um, we launched um, uh, Tier on Discovery, which we moved to a Blacklight implementation. Um, and so we, we found that to be, uh, again, still continuing to be our philosophy of doing shared discovery tools within our uh, most um, local and, and prized uh, consortium partnership, um, and continues to um, represent the philosophies and the vision we have for open library systems. Um, all along the way, we were keeping tabs of Folio. We were um, contributing um, not only with the grant hosting and, and developers support that we had internally, but also um, through various uh, special interest groups and um, community leadership. Um, but we weren't quite ready to go live um, as, as quickly as our peers have been. And we still have realized we have a number of um, analog uh, workflows and, and um, library collection strategies that require us to wait uh, for a little bit more uh, functionality to come along. Um, but we decided we wanted to make progress iteratively, and so we, we adopted an approach to implement um, different modules of Folio as we felt they were ready and as we felt we could implement them um, prudently. Um, so like University of Chicago, we didn't have an electronic resource management in the past, um, and so we felt that moving to Folio uh, ERM was in our best interest, and in fact, it was one of the best decisions we probably made in a long time um, for our implementations is because we were able to get a jump start on not only learning the Folio system, but also um, building in workflows that we had really been um, struggling with um, for many years. Uh, and then this past summer, um, in advance of uh, returning uh, students to campus full time, we implemented the Folio courses module uh, and the Folio inventory module so we could start to continue to build on our, our Folio implementation. Um, and this has been uh, an excellent um, continued iterative process for us to implement um, Folio. Uh, we have a goal of uh, doing our, completing our implementation of Folio by summer of 2023. We're going to continue doing this iteratively. Um, and what I don't mention in this slide, but I will uh, say out loud, is we are um, hosting with Index Data as a um, service provider. And um, we will be engaging with um, Index Data starting in early 2022 um, for our project management of our full implementation lifecycle. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sean Nicholson, uh, Associate Dean for Digital Initiatives at Michigan State University. Uh, we're a relatively uh, young partner in all this. Uh, our journey begins in 20, the fall of 2019, uh, where our Dean of Libraries uh, authorized us to move forward with an RFP. Uh, to replace a Sierra, innovative Sierra-based uh, ILS. Um, by 2020, we had a recommendation and uh, a leap of faith to go with uh, Folio, uh, fully believing uh, its mantra that the future of libraries is indeed open. And we uh, appreciated uh, the modular nature of Folio and believe that would fit our implementation path. Uh, beginning in October of that year, uh, a whole structure was created to uh, manage it locally, but we also contracted with EBSCO. And I think it's uh, <coughs> important for me to mention here, um, while we had uh, been tracking Olay for a while, it was the entrance of some major vendors into this market. Uh, and as Simeon uh, outlined in our opening, um, you know, that multi uh, sort of approach where there's vendors, there's community involvement, there's individuals creating modules that might be on the edge. Uh, that's what tipped it for Michigan State to uh, go forward. And um, again, because it was modular and unlike our uh, friends at Chicago, uh, we believe that we must go at a fiscal year, uh, but we uh, singled out 
the finance and acquisitions modules and ERM to go live in uh, July, which corresponds with our uh, fiscal year, uh, but could set aside circulation and cataloging uh, the two areas of the LSP that we felt were most wanting per our needs. Uh, we um, talked gingerly and um, in hushed tones about uh, going live with those two uh, elements, the pillars of folio uh, in this uh, time frame of this year. Uh, but after our assessment, um, I think uh, Simeon said it was his was uh, reasonable. Uh, I don't know if ours is reasonable, but we did make the decision to postpone. Uh, we uh, are now targeting uh, moving forward uh, in June of uh, 2022. And uh, we're currently on um, Juniper Hotfix 4 and uh, have been successfully migrating with each software release. Uh, those of you that are new to uh, Folio, their uh, software releases correspond with a set of flowers and they're alphabetic. Um, uh, so we'll be uh, moving forward with Kiwi, which I did not know was a flower until I uh, joined the Folio community. Uh, I thought it was a bird. Um, uh, but we'll be moving forward with that in um, January. And um, the other thing I should point out is as an EBSCO client, uh, we're going to be one of the largest uh, in the world uh, once we uh, migrate our uh, data and uh, our full inventory is looking at a little over 11 million uh, items. And so um, the bottom, uh, second to the bottom, uh, may upgrade to Lotus and cut over. <laughs> Uh, what we found, uh, there's a very nice roadmap for the um, flower releases of the software, uh, but we have seen some slippage, and I mentioned before we're on Juniper Hotfix 4, which is a critical uh, element. Um, so we're playing this by ear about our uh, migration uh, pattern because we are targeting Lotus as some key features for our library. And uh, we've been very fortunate that our um, campus has supported us financially. So we're running, um, uh, you know, committed to uh, Folio and committed to our partners at EBSCO to help host and do some project management for us. But we're also maintaining our subscription to Innovative Sierra. And without that, um, we would have been pushed uh, much too fast uh, for not only the technology, but the psychology of our uh, library. And, and uh, I think we might get into that a little bit later in the Q&A. Um, but uh, I will close with that. So the ordering did work out for Stanford, both alphabetically, because I believe we're last, but also chronologically, because we are the newest uh, institution, at least on this stage, uh, to jump towards Folio. Uh, we've been running uh, what's currently Symphony for about the last 25 years, and uh, we're, it, it actually works. Uh, it is not a house on fire, and so for us, the decision to uh, first explore and then move towards Folio is because we see this as a good strategic opportunity, and the timing is right. Um, uh, around 2018, 2019, uh, as with many of the other institutions on stage, we had our eye on the ILS market, and in 2019, we said it, is, uh, it would probably make sense to organize an investigation and exploration into Folio, so we formed a steering committee at that time and basically spent the next year uh, monitoring and observing how Folio worked as a software project and as an open source community. Uh, in 2021, so at the beginning of this year, uh, we stepped up our level of intensity uh, to do a more formal evaluation, formed campus-wide steering group with the idea of taking all of the coordinate libraries at Stanford into a single platform with harmonized processes uh, and a, most importantly, a harmonized user experience uh, with loan policies and discovery experiences, for example. And in uh, Q3, uh, we actually made the formal decision to go. Uh, we, we had sort of been expecting we would go that way the entire time. We found nothing that surprised us. And uh, once we pieced together the things, uh, all of the individual elements, we realized it was, it was doable. So we're uh, uh, not rushing this because we are looking at this as a chance not only to do the system uh, migration, but also a re-engineering of our own processes and practices internally 
uh, there's a collective sense, especially among our technical services unit, that um, rather than managing our current ILS, perhaps it has managed us. And we have processes and practices that we're no longer sure exactly why we have them, except that's the way things work. Uh, so it's our intention to go through in a very methodical way and in harmonization with the other library units on campus to really come up with an enterprise platform. Uh, we are expecting to go live on originally, it turns out, at our fiscal year cutover uh, in 2023-24. And so right now that is just under two years away. And I think one of the things that we're looking at is um, we're interested not in a drop-in system, but something that will grow and evolve with us. So we're looking, the, um, the convergence of physical and digital, we think is one of the most important aspects of the ILS. We feel like we've been unable to achieve some of the things that we would have liked to uh, in our current platform. We're looking at things, can we, um, uh, can we describe data sets or maybe either um, link compliance with data usage agreements for research data sets or link out to systems that do that. These are things that are difficult to imagine in our current environment. Uh, from looking at Folio, we think this is completely feasible, although it's not there on day one, but we expect it to be there over the next, we're, we're looking at this as a kind of a 10-year journey. So that's where we are, and I think we can turn it over to Q&A now. Um, so we envision this a bit of uh, a hybrid here. Um, we'd like to start with um, sort of a raise of hands or a a hoot or a holler. How many of you are here just because you're curious about Folio? Okay. And how many of you are seriously thinking about moving to Folio? Fewer. Are you raising your hand? I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, are there any people in the audience that might represent um, libraries that have commenced planning for folio implementation? Looks like two maybe that are, could be up here on the panel with us. Okay. A select few. Yeah. A, an elite. Uh, so, so we imagine this is a bit of a hybrid. We're, um, I'm going to act somewhat like a discussant and engage the panel but we also want to engage you because um, we want to hear your questions. So be starting to formulate them, uh, but I'd like to start uh, the panel with uh, this question. How was the idea seeded on your campus and how did you build support? And we'll start with Chicago. So as I described a little in, in um, my history of this, I think that the idea was seeded partly because we had already made that decision around Olay and Folio was where Olay was going and it seemed like a natural you know, move for us. But as I said, we actually did stop and say we should step back and make sure that we really all are in agreement that this is the direction we should be moving. There were many things that had been very rocky about Olay. And so I think we really felt like it was important to seriously consider what all of our options were because we saw that as a way of making sure that our staff really had a voice in re, you know, committing to the idea of a development system, an open source system. But I should say before we were involved in Olay, we had been a Horizon library and we were development partners with Horizon. And before that, we had been on a system called LDMS, which had been built in-house back in, this was before my time, but I wanna say the 70s or 80s, it, it had been around for a long time. So I do think that culturally, this was a really good fit for us. We always have been interested in having a hand in that development. So I think if you're coming from that environment, this fits very easily. And maybe some of our colleagues may have, you know, come from a different place and may have a different way of approaching what it means to, to get that buy-in. Uh, Tom from... Uh, yeah, so I, I think I described it a little bit. There's sort of a pent-up urge to move to kind of a more flexible or uh, evolving 
ILS, and as we were watching the marketplace, it seemed to us that Folio was something that was uh, very promising um, technically, but also uh, from a community basis. And so we just started by dipping our toes in the water, um, talking to people, uh, attending meetings, and then we went kind of ankle deep and knee deep. I guess we're about hip level at this point. Um, the uh, the I guess from our experience, the the more it is an open source product and an open source community. And if you're hoping to figure things out by uh, reading documentation or glossy PDFs on the website, uh, you're not going to get very far. So for us, really kind of uh, going to some key meetings and listening in on all of the meetings which are open has been instrumental in trying to figure out where things are and how we might work in the community. Yeah. Uh so on that, Jamie, could you talk a little bit more? I think your um, multi-campus aspect is important here. I'd be happy to. I mean, you know, I, I can't speak for our other campuses. I can only, you know, talk about my perspective from CU Boulder. Um, but I think that for us, it was really an opportunity to think about how can we shape the future of our own infrastructure collaboratively as a university. And it, it, it is, it is really about that focus on what the kind of LSP of the future is, um, but there were also financial uh, factors. And you know, when I was talking to some of our other libraries, I mean, the, uh, the value proposition you know, from a practical perspective was centered around this financial futures proposal. And so there was a, um, a cost element there as well, where we said, you know, if this is something that we all want to contribute to and we think we can do together, you know, it can save us X percent on our costs as a university. And I think that that was important for us um, as a public university and a state institution. We're always trying to do better by our, by our state. So that was a factor as well. Uh, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. And um, Simeon, uh, you're the furthest along of the institutions. Could you um, share with us some of the pain points or uh, considerations that uh, folks out here might be wanting to think about as they uh, consider going live? But um, I don't want you to focus only on the negatives, but I think um, sharing some of those will be illuminating. Thanks. Well, I think for us it really was a case over this last year or two of tracking What's the reality of where's the project at? You know, we'd bought into the vision, the architecture, the notion of community and open source. That's all great, but at the end of the day, we do need a system that works. So for us, part of the decision to go live was about what is it we really need to go live that allows us to take a step forward onto this new track where we will get everything we want sometime down the road. And we did go right on the cusp of Folio being sufficient for us to get by. It's an enormous credit to our staff for managing to do this. One, for managing to make the assessment carefully enough that we didn't get it wrong and crash and burn on July 1. That would have been bad. And also to our staff for putting up with a system that was only just ready. So initially we had some performance issues which we had to work through with with ebsco to make sure that we got say circulation performance that was okay and things and there have been a number of improvements since then and now that we look at the pipeline of future releases we're expecting to get a lot more at the end of this week and we'll get more with kiwi and we'll get more with lotus so we see a path to where we want to be but we did opt to go at the the earliest opportunity, I think. Um, I guess the advice for people looking forward is take a realistic look about where you think the project will be. Now you decide next summer, I guess if anyone's thinking about it now, you're thinking about summer 2023, where I think Folio will be in great shape by then. And, and Tim, I, I think we would appreciate hearing from you. Um, you have some elements live and some you've chosen to uh, postpone maybe up towards the two years. Could you talk a little bit about uh, pain points and some advice? Sure. Um, we, we, we have a, a little bit of different approach than Stanford has taken as far as the way that they've examined 
um, their implementation strategy and, and also um, the way that we do things. We have quite a bit of autonomy within our departments to set workflows. And, and I think I definitely agree with what Tom had shared earlier about the ILS sort of directing our work rather than the other way around. Um, and it, it, it has required us to, to think a little bit more carefully about what it means to do um, our work at scale in, in a different workflow. Um, so we, we did take advantage of moving to some of the areas that we didn't have before, like ERM, because uh, it was an opportunity for us to use a new, a new product, um, for us to, to jump into it without a workflow that's been already defined for 20, 25 years. Um, and so that, that was really helpful. Um, we also spent a great deal of time um, investing early, early days of Folio with the special interest groups. Um, we volunteered some people to be project owners. Um, and, and so for, for um, in some regards, we have seen where the deepest um, parts of the sausages are made. And so for us, there was some reconciling of what are the things that we know and um, how deep we know those, and then how can we step back and think about a different process for, for our implementation. Um, and so um, that, that's, been, that's been an important process uh, for us as well. You know, one of the things that, um, one of the ways that I'm trying to change the narrative and think about the ways that we approach our implementation has been to break down this idea that just because it's a next generation library system, that because Folio is a next generation library system, doesn't mean it's actually going to do everything we used to do in the, in the past. So it's not backwards compatible, not everything is backwards compatible. So that means we're going to think, need to think about what we take forward with us. Um, and even re-examining back from the time we went from um, DRA into Aleph many years ago, we force fit a lot of those things in there. That doesn't mean it's gonna be, we're gonna be able to force fit those things out of Aleph and into, and into Folio. So we're, we're taking a, a very careful approach to some of those. Um, so you in the audience, you've heard uh, some level setting, you've heard some <laughs> uh, peaks and some valleys here. Uh, we're curious if any of you have any questions. I think there might be a couple microphones if you want to step. Yeah, please. I think over here to uh, my right first. Yes. Um, hi, Cynthia Schwartz from Temple University. Um, Several of you mentioned that you have developers that you've dedicated to the project, um, but then you're also working with either Index Data or EBSCO. Um, so how much, kind of in your fair assessment, how much active developer work is required from the institution versus you know, having the hosting services? Let's go alphabetically. So we have developers that are working on our own integrations that we have built around our, our ILS systems. We don't have developers currently that are actually contributing back to the project. So it's not something you have to do. I think that one of the questions here in general is how we all think about what our, our how can we best commit to the project? And we did at times have, uh, I, had a, I actually had two people who were acting as product owners, but never developers. There is a process to become a developer on the project to actually make sure you understand or to developing good code. And we just didn't have the bandwidth to do that. So not necessary, but it was absolutely necessary for us we have a lot of things we had built around our systems, what we kind of call our helper apps and such, and we've had a lot of developer time doing that. But that's gonna depend on whether you have that type of thing or not. Um, and, and we also, I should say, had built that around Olay, so we had very few partners. We were one of, of three institutions that had ever gone live on Olay, so we also didn't have the same kind of community that might have been working together to build integrations. So in some ways, that, that left us more on our own for many of those. I guess we're the alphabetical by institution. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Cornell has, over time, contributed various amounts of developer effort to the project. And Elizabeth mentioned that's not essential. There is a a formal membership model as part of the government structure of Folio now. 
where they would very happily take a pledge of developer effort or a monetary contribution or both. Um, I try to think about what does it mean to have a sustainable community project going forward. So when I think about how much does Folio cost, I think we've got some amount that we're going to have to pay for our own installation to be supported, whether we do that in-house or whether we, as we do at the moment, choose to have a vendor do that. And then I imagine, well, what should be the level of our commitment to maintaining this community project? So at the moment, we are contributing one FTE. That's half an FTE of product owner and half an FTE of development to the project. So they are not doing things directed by us, they're directed by the community. We also have had a larger contribution in the past, but that was to sort of help the project get started more. Um, and just as Elizabeth said, we obviously have development work for our own in-house other projects since we have our own discovery system. At CU Boulder, we have two full-time developers that are working on our uh, migration specifically. So we had been contributing half of a developer since 2017, and this year we made the decision to not make that commitment and to make other kinds of financial um, and uh, in-kind contributions to the project so that we could focus all of our effort on our own instance of Folio. However, uh, our junior developer on the project, as part of his onboarding, um, we thought it would be a good idea for him to contribute to the Folio community. And so in practice, we actually still have half a, de half a developer that's contributing to the community. Um, and I asked him about how that was going, and he said that it's been um, a really wonderful introduction to the project, and, um, and, and it served the library really well. In, in practice, we also have other developers that have been helping out with this project. And I'll say, from a, from a staff perspective, I mean, we have, I would say, 20 to 30 people in our libraries, staff and faculty, who are putting a lot of effort towards this migration. So this is a very resource-intensive migration for us. And um, we're, all, we're all really focused on making sure that when we go live, um, it's as successful as possible. So... Uh, we're definite, it's definitely a, a, a dedicated project for many people in our library. Yeah, at Duke, we, we hosted um, all of the developers that came through the Mellon Grants um, that were um, wholly paid for by the Mellon Grants, and we were fortunate enough to retain one of them for our own um, position. Um, and we, uh, we got to have him for about a year and a half before he moved on to another opportunity. Um, we don't have any developers right now working on the project um, at the moment. Um, I'm, we're about, just about to, to search for that vacancy, and um, like Jamie said, we're probably going to um, encourage that new developer to take a half-time role and, and jump into the project and onboard that way so that they can get involved. Um, but I agree very much with, with Simeon's context of how to think about the cost of the project, and we're going to approach the ongoing um, sustainability of Folio very much the same way of any other open source project, whether it be Simbera or DSpace or um, Blacklight, et cetera. But I will add one um, nuance um, uh, to the answer that's outside of the programmer perspective, and that is we took the um, initiative to invest in business analysts before we started our Folio project. Um, our, our investigation of our peers that went with Alma and, and saw what um, their, um, their process was like um, convinced us that a business analyst role would really be beneficial to our staff, uh, particularly as we're trying to go from one system to another, because having somebody do their whole day job, spend some time contributing to Folio, and then also prepare for an implementation was going to be really taxing on those individuals. Uh, frankly, particularly some individuals who's only known this work for the past 20 years that they've been at Duke and haven't known anything different. And so it was really important for me to invest in some business analysts who could be thinking about um, folio and the workflows at a higher level could be making some of these translations between this is the way that you do your job in one system, this is the way you're going to do your job in another system. These are some inefficiencies that we've just done because this is the way Aleph has worked. These are some efficiencies we're going to gain because we're going to do it this way. This is how efficient it is in Aleph. These are some inefficiencies as present for folio, but help us to do it better in the future. We, here are some ways that we think could work out. Um, that was a really important step for us, um, and I think uh, it's going to create a great deal of sustainability. Um, 
at Michigan State, we committed to one FTE uh, engage in the community. And so that person's uh, full role is out in the community and works on a team called Thunderjet. And, um, and uh, it's primarily focused on acquisitions and the financial areas, which I indicated in my earlier comments was our uh, key priority. Uh, we also have about, uh, I, I tried to do the math here, I'm going to guess at around a quarter FTE for our local integrations of development time. But I also wanted to um, echo a couple of my colleagues' comments. Uh, we also contribute uh, financially uh, to the community, and that hires uh, developers, and but also pays for infrastructure like the Amazon and such. Um, but we believe that that's an important part of our role. And then... This idea of the capaciousness of what a developer is, um, our staff are uh, doing an amazing amount of work, whether it be just uh, creating uh, lists of content to send to the uh, migration team, uh, things like that, uh, that are uh, maybe not uh, typically thought of as um, developers, but uh, I want to uh, acknowledge their time and effort uh, because, as uh, Jamie indicated, it, it is a it's a significant thing. It's a, you know it's a it underlies all that we do as a library. So at Stanford, we've hired an incremental folio. But the title was folio developer, or at least that was the shorthand uh, when we made the hire. They are going to be allocated 100% our, on our implementation through 23, and after that point, we think they'll be in a position to step forward into the community-based role. Um, and then, of course, we've got a bunch of other developers who will be working on the integrations and the local implementation. So, uh, and partly that was because we feel as new, relative newcomers to the community, we're not really sure what uh, effective contribution we can give or where the greatest priorities will be. So part of it is just learning and coming up to speed ourselves. There's one big caveat, and I'll just slip this in because I don't know if it'll come up in any other questions. We have another team uh, for the last several years We've been part of the LD4P uh, grants and working on linked database cataloging. We're at the point in that series of projects where we figured out that for linked data to really take off in the library descriptive environment, it needs an integration with an ILS. So we currently have our, our, full, um, our full development team that's working on that is putting half their time into feature enhancements for Synopia, the linked data editor, and the other half of the time is actually working on a integration right now with Folio which is an awesome example of kind of the openness that comes with uh, an open source software platform. Thank you for being so patient. All of this is really, really fascinating. Um, my name is Kara Watley, I'm at Caltech, and I didn't raise my hand earlier um, because we've actually already migrated. Um, and I didn't realize that everybody uh, migrated to align with their fiscal year, but we did. So we came up in sep at the end of September. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing like how much of our um, experience has been echoed there. And um, I'm really interested in, in kind of the things that you were just talking about, you know, sort of where you're putting your development time and, and kind of where um, you're thinking about um, continuing to develop Folio. One of the things that we've been working on is controlled digital lending. Um, and I thought I heard one of you mention it earlier in the in the panel. So that's that's what I was interested in is is hearing you say a little bit more about your thinking um, of CDL related to Folio. Thanks. I guess I should answer first since I think it was me who said that. <laughs> um, so as far as I'm aware, there is no concrete attempt to implement CDL directly integrated. But as other people have said the extensibility of a folio is one of the reasons we think it's a good basis going forward. And especially this sort of dealing with both, both print and digital in the same system. I just put it out there as an example of something that would have been, say, outside of the purview of a traditional ILS, but fits within the notion of a library services platform. And I can also add that, in fact, we are in the process of installing what you've done for CDL, and, and it is exactly, we're very interested in that. We had been, had a test instance of another CDL solution, but we're much more interested in one that could integrate with Folio and that, that to us was more future looking. And so we're, 
just now in the kind of implementation test phase of it, but I think that it is also a really good example of, of how and why we went for this platform because of our interest in being able to grow it into, into new areas like that. And I want to point, and, and link data as well. That was really one of our interests at the time, was it seemed to be the one system that was looking towards being able to expand in those ways. I can put a, a little bit different hat on at the moment and say um, as the, um, I have two more weeks left as the chair of the ReShare um, steering committee that ReShare is going into the CDL um, development perspective and uh, ReShare as a software shares some infrastructure, um, common infrastructure with Folio. So um, not only does that um, speak to the extensibility of Folio and the underlying software, but it allows uh, us for having different kind of modularity that can do connections. So. Um, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards about that. We have another question over here. So um, uh, one of the things we often don't talk about in presentations like this, and I will be myself, I'll call myself out, um, is what did you have to deprioritize when you took on this work? Um, are there certain things that you wish you could have done instead? Um, that maybe you had to push off what was the consternation that then occurred because that always occurs when you have to deprioritize things. And I'd love to hear that conversation. And again, I've done these panels and I am guilty of not um, talking about that myself. I can, I can start because I feel like we have had to deprioritize a lot. I mean, when you make a decision to do something this big, you have to deprioritize or else, you know, you, won't, you will have a lot of very unhappy librarians uh, that are overworked. My product owner for Folio, I think I said to him, are you okay with just doing this for two years? I mean, this is pretty much all that you're going to have time to do. And, you know, we sort of made this commitment to each other. Okay, this is what we're doing. And you know he's been with our library for a long time, and he's tenured, and that matters, right? Um, so I think that you know just the pressure on people's time um, and capacity is is part of it. But we've also put off migrating to other open source products. So we had plans to migrate our digital library to Samvera. We still are are planning to do that. Um, we're currently on a proprietary platform, and uh, it's it's had to be sort of pushed back because this was our highest priority uh, in our library. So certainly some things had to be deprioritized and we're continuing on with that platform with some of the same problems that we've always had with that platform. Um, but uh, but we, you know, when we, when we look at, at how far we've come with Folio, we think that we've made the, the right decisions here and we think that our, our prioritization of Folio is going to pay off for us down the road. So it's, I'll start with there's just the opportunity costs that are lost. And so there were um, some bespoke applications that were in our planning cycle. And when we devote an entire FTE developer to the Folio community, that means you cannot do those things. So we deprioritized those um, and identified them and said they needed to wait. Um, but one thing that we're being recorded, right? Um, <laughs> uh, acquisitions has suffered. Um, we've had to deprioritize some of the high-level, rapid turnarounds. Um, um, we, we pay our bills, but they take a lot longer, frankly, because some of the folios, uh, I'm not an acquisitions person, but uh, my understanding is uh, some of the functionality of folios acquisitions and the uh, finance uh, modules, uh, it's a struggle to get through those. And so... And that's hard on staff who had prided themselves for so many years of you know being on top of all that. Um, so those are two areas that I can point to pretty easily. Thanks for your question. And I would also add to to be honest, I think we've <laughs> we've sacrificed a certain amount of just production work. And and I, I would say that in light of really um, seconding what. Tim said about a business analyst. We don't have one. We, we really, I think, have suffered from not being able to fill a position like that. And we've, 
had the advantage that our staff, having been involved very recently in the move to Olay and being involved in the development, are able to actually do a lot of that work. And they, they don't need someone to help them think through that, but it means they're spending their time doing that. And that means they're not able to spend as much time doing, doing their just regular work. And we've had to really look at balancing that. And so I think the more you have some staffing based on just to do the work of the migration and the planning, the less that you have that. But we've really been, been torn between the two, partly because of open positions and such. I see we have one more question, but I want to just add one little, little twist to the answer, which is we deprioritize folio in our, in our processing planning in, in, at Duke, really, um, because we recognize that as the ones who started this whole thing, we couldn't really back out for any other reason besides total failure, which we didn't see, obviously, um, in the future, and we certainly didn't want. So we chose some other priorities first. We chose to um, do our discovery layer first. We chose to do our Drupal migration next. Um, and we knew that we had some time um, to deprioritize Folio and do that a little bit slower. I'm, I'm very sorry, uh, but we have reached time. Uh, I'm sure the panelists would be happy to uh, chat with you with your question. Um, uh, as a de facto discussant, uh, I hope you would uh, join me in thanking uh, the panelists and myself. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for attending, and we look forward to continuing the conversation.